my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor Jeffrey Engel, founding director of the Center for Presidential History at Southern <coughs> Methodist University. After getting his PhD from the University of Wisconsin, Jeff taught at Yale University, University of Pennsylvania, Haverford College, and Texas A&M University, where he was a professor and director of programming at the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs. He joined us in 2012. Jeff is the author of The Cold War at 3,000 Feet, Anglo-American Fight for the Aviation Supremacy with Harvard University Press. The editor of the China Diary of George H.W. Bush, which reflects considerably more scholarship than the word editor typically connotes. And the author and editor of seven other books. Today he's going to talk about his new book, When the World Seemed New. George H.W. Bush on the end of the Cold War, published with Houghton Mifflin Harcourt just last month. When the World Seemed New offers an in-depth, deeply researched, and engrossing account of the strategic, strategically critical years of the Bush 41 presidency, which marked the end of what the historian Eric Hobsbawm identified as the short 20th century, from 1914, beginning of the Great War, to 1991 with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Copies of When the World Seemed New will be available for purchase after the talk. Let me just say a word that uh, when I began doing some research at the uh, Bush Presidential Library College Station, uh, Jeff was one of the first to ask me to, uh, actually the first to ask me to lunch and show me a nearby spot and make me feel so very much welcome there. Later on at a conference in Dallas, my back went out, which happens every few years. And, and foolishly uh, and naively, I rejected his repeated offers for a ride back after the conference to the hotel where we were. So anyway, this is all to say that I've known him for a long time as a gifted and generous scholar and friend, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome him, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming to talk about his new book, When the World Seemed New. President, before I begin formal remarks, I just want to say what a great pleasure it is to be at the University of, of Texas, and I'm allowed to say that now that I no longer teach at Texas A&M. Uh, and also, yeah, uh, and um, especially given how impressive the strides have been that you've been made in the national security field um, since I've come to Texas, and of course the last couple years in particular, it's really wonderful to have such great leadership in this field, but it's such an important field at this time in our country, so thank you all for that. So what I want to talk to you today is obviously about the new book, but I want to set the stage a little differently to remind you of the time period that we're talking about, which is, of course, a happier time in many ways, an optimistic time, a halcyonic time, a time that we can call looking back with a nice fuzzy lens of memory as being a time when the world seemed to be going right. And I speak, of course, of the end of the Cold War. And I speak, of course, of that time when the world seemed to be going not just right, but in two particular ways. First, in a democratic way, which is to say, one looks throughout the world in the late 1980s and the early 1990s and sees a series of peaceful, that's remarkable, but peaceful democratic revolutions going on throughout the world, whether it's in Eastern Europe, whether it's the Soviet Union itself, even the beginnings of a democratic movement, snuffed out, it's true, but the beginnings of a democratic movement in China as well. Everywhere one looked, one seemed to see democracy on the march. And simultaneously, it also was a period where the United States seemed to have everything going its way. Which is to say, the end of this period is when we began to discuss this new idea, this dangerous idea, this at least debatable idea, of whether or not the United States should actually assume the role of hegemon in the world. That is to say, we are so powerful, we are so dominant, not just militarily, but economically, but culturally, and here's the kicker, people also liked us around the world, and we were popular, that maybe we should try to run the world in our image. And that is really the cross-section of currents, where the book begins, where the book of George Bush's life and times in his administration begins. Because we think back on this as really a much happier, more optimistic time than it actually was. In fact, the, the way that people typically remember this period, if you want to shorthand, is through a phrase coined not by Bush, but rather by a political scientist, Francis Fukuyama, who referred to this period as the end of history. The single worst understood title of any book in, in history, 
that's undoubtedly true. It's a discussion of Hegelian dialectics in which uh, Fukuyama makes the following basic argument, that all of human society, all of human history, from the very beginning, has been essentially a competition and a struggle to determine what form or fashion of government and society we should have. And all have been tried. If you want to think about this, this is my example, not his. It's a giant NCAA bracket of different competitions for different political systems. You had fascism, you had communism. In fact, the 20th century comes down really to those two, or those three, rather, democracy, fascism, and communism. And in fact, fascism obviously loses at the end of the Second World War, leaving the entire Cold War as the finals between the United, between uh, a democratic world and a communist world. And Fukuyama argues, looking at the world and seeing these democratic transformations, that we have reached the pivotal moment. That's it. The finals, it's over. It's from here on in, things are still going to happen. Wars are still going to happen. So long as human beings exist and have passions, there's going to be conflict. But it's always going to be conflict in a democratic realm. That is to say, states are going to recognize over time that this is the way the entire world functions best until in time, the entire world is democratic. The point of history, if you will, had been reached. What's interesting about that speech, or about that talk, rather, about the paper, which obviously then becomes a best-selling book, in fact, I'd like to point out it's the single best-selling book on Hegelian dialectics ever. Um, also tells you that most people who bought the book did not read it. Um, because why would you read it if you know the title? I mean, you know the entire argument. You, you can do quite well at a cocktail party. The thing that's interesting about this argument is that this is the exact same argument that George Bush made in January of 1989 at his inaugural address. Now, I've never found any sense of plagiarism there that Fukuyama published his several months after Bush's. But Bush essentially argues the same thing, that all of human history has been decided. We no longer have to debate long into the night, Bush says at that speech, about what type of government to have. We know what works best. In fact, he comes back to that phrase again and again. We know what works. What works is freedom. What works is democracy. We know how to build a better life for our people, and that's the open and free exchange of ideas. And that the day of the dictator, he says, is over. All of human history came down to this moment, and a new world is open. A new breeze of freedom, if you will, is flowing. And Bush gives this talk, gives this speech in January of 1989, as uh, obviously the start of his administration, but more importantly, from I think our perspective, and starting today, as a culminating statement about his entire life up until that moment. Because that is, in fact, the quintessential essence of George Bush's life and diplomacy, which is that not only do we know what works, democracy, freedom, America, markets, any synonym you want to use there, but there's a particular emphasis on the word no, which is to say these are not things that should be questioned. These are not things that can be questioned. It is implicitly, explicitly, quite obvious to anyone who is paying attention in Bush's world that democracy is best, that markets are best. Now, when I say best, please note, I don't mean ideal. There are still always ways to improve. He's a politician. You don't get elected by saying we're done. But it is still the better system available out there. And it really encapsulates Bush's entire life. If you think about this man, this man who becomes president in 1989 with, I would argue, the single best resume of any person to assume the Oval Office in American history. His entire life had been largely not only a series of successes, but a validation in, within each of the American system. He, of course, is born at the pinnacle of the system. He's born uh, to the manor, if you will, to a family that is both politically well-connected and also financially well-secured. He goes to the best private schools. He then joins the Navy at the age of 18 after Pearl Harbor, ultimately becomes the youngest naval aviator in the Pacific Theater. Actually, it's not true, that's a lie. Uh, we found out later that subsequently that someone was two days younger, but it sounds so not well. It's not good to say. He was the second youngest. You're not really surprised. So forget I said that. He was the youngest Navy leader uh, in the U.S. Navy, and ultimately becomes a war hero in that Navy. He is shot down, uh, receives uh, honors uh, for his service, comes back to the United States, finishes college, becomes a successful millionaire out of the oil fields in West Texas, then runs for Congress successfully from Houston, and everywhere we see success after success after success. In fact, we even see Bush succeed when he fails. 
Bush actually loses the, 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 the nomination, or excuse me, the fight for the Senate in C from Texas in 1968 to Lloyd Benson. He loses this, uh, actually, I'm sorry, he loses this uh, largely because it's a really difficult thing for a Republican in the early 70s to run against a Democrat who's also more conservative than the Republican. And so there's really no place for anybody to go. He loses this election and winds up getting a promotion because he had already worked his way into the system of American society, American government, and had forged connections for decades at this point with the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, who essentially gave him not only a soft landing spot, but a boost up, a boost up that changed his entire career. George Bush at that moment became UN ambassador from the United States. And he became a UN ambassador for a very particular reason. This is the reason that he argued he should be named UN ambassador, and that is that he knew absolutely nothing about diplomacy. Which, by the way, is exactly the way Henry Kissinger wanted it. Because Henry Kissinger was not really interested, he being the, the prime mover in Nixon's foreign policy at the time, not really interested in other people's opinions, and not particularly interested in other people's initiatives. So to have essentially a blank slate of a politician come to him and say, I will do whatever you say at the United Nations, and by the way, I fit in well there, I'm from that community, that is too appealing even for, for Kissinger to pass up. And this opens Bush's eyes, opens Bush's entire world to this new world of diplomacy that ultimately becomes, as we know, his passion. He is remembered, of course, today as a person with particular diplomatic expertise, but that does not begin until he's already in his 50s. Now, again, he has a series of problems that ultimately lead to successes. For example, during the cabinet reshuffle of 1972, President Nixon Asked ask Bush, actually asks is not the right title, but tells Bush that he is going to now become head of the Republican National Committee. He neglects to tell him that Watergate is about to break. And consequently, Bush spends the next two odd years essentially going out every day and publicly being the face of the defense of a president who he increasingly believed was guilty. And increasingly believed, more importantly, was politically untenable and had to go. This Bush calls the most exhausting period of his entire life. And in fact, at the end of that period, at the end of Watergate, when President Ford assumes control, he is uh, politely asked by the Ford administration, wouldn't you like to take some time off? Which is to say, we want to reward you for your good service. You have been a loyal deputy, loyalty matters. But you also have been the face of Watergate. So we'd like you not to be in public face for the time being. So why don't you choose to become an ambassador to one of those two places that anybody would pick? either Paris or London. To which George Bush responds, I want to go to China. Now I have to tell you, he responded that way before he mentioned this to his wife, Barbara. And there's a couple of reasons why he chose to go to China, which I think are each equally insightful. The first is because China was brand new. China had just been opened, if you will, to American diplomacy. China was a place where you could see the incubator of American democracy, perhaps, start its very first penetration. China was also obviously a rising power. China was essentially where the action was. China also was extremely far away from Washington. Uh, there is there's no phone call that you can make at this point. Uh, this is a place if you want to have a sabbatical and get away from exhaustion, this is a pretty good place to go. You may not be that way today, but remember we're talking 1974. And lastly, and not least important, uh, China was a lot cheaper than London or Paris, where the ambassador was expected to supplement the, uh, the entertainment budget of the Embassy. And Bush, quite honestly, wrote in his diary, I still have three more kids to put through college. So consequently, he leaves and again manages to, with every failure, with every difficulty, rise up to Fuji until ultimately he is, of course, not only the CIA director in the late at latter parts of the Ford director administration, but ultimately vice president to Ronald Reagan. And here, too, we see another instance where this man, who has essentially <coughs> lost repeatedly, keeps winning and moving up, if you will. Because he, of course, loses the nomination battle to, Richard, uh, to, to Ronald Reagan in 1980, though he does leave a particular legacy. He is the one who coins the term that we most think about now as the essential critique of supply-side economics. That is to say, Bush is the first one to use the term voodoo economics. And in fact, he is the leader coming out of Iowa from the caucuses, and then subsequently gets steamrolled by the Reagan machine. But what's really important about this moment is that when given the opportunity to join Bush on the ticket, Bush not only says yes, he says yes loyally. Which is to say, I am not going to say anything over the next four years or eight years 
that President Reagan will ever have to worry about. I agree with him, no matter what he says. This is actually an extension of something that Bush had said about America in general. At one point in the campaign trail, he said, I would never apologize for the United States, even if it was wrong. Because some things are more important, if you will, than scratching at the actual accurate truth. Things like the paradigms that make America great. Things like loyalty, things like respecting the president's rule and knowing that a president shouldn't have to worry about where his wingman is, if you will. Now this is particularly important to the story because behind the scenes, we now know, Bush thought Reagan was quite wrong about the key foreign policy issue of the day and certainly of Reagan's second term, which of course means certainly of Bush's first term, which is what to do with the Soviet Union. What to do with this radical new person named Mikhail Gorbachev who is radically transforming the entire world. Those democratic revolutions I mentioned from 1980s, those began in essence not in Washington, but rather in Moscow, in the Kremlin even. When a man named Mikhail Gorbachev decided that he was going to not only recognize the flaws of the Soviet system, but here's more important, he was going to do something about it. Now here is one of the, what I'm going to say, one of two things that usually make people particularly mad, so I like to highlight that so you can get ready for it, about my speech. Uh, the, and that is this. If I walk down the street, even in Austin, and ask people, why did the Cold War end? And who made it end? I would probably get some variation of the following. It ended because Ronald Reagan commanded it so. Because Ronald Reagan built up American forces, military forces in particular, in a way that demonstrated to the Soviets that they could not compete, they could not keep up. He also built up American moral power and political power and essentially called the Soviets out on their problems and forced the Soviets to change. That is what most Americans believe. It actually fits quite nicely with the general Reagan hagiography that, of course, infuses the Republican Party, at least until this last administration, this current administration. Um, in fact, I like to tell my students, because uh, I care about my students, that uh, the single worst drinking game you could possibly play is to watch a Republican presidential primary and take a shot anytime someone uses the word Reagan. Um, because it wouldn't last five minutes. And it's particularly unfair, by the way, when we had the debate at the Reagan Library. Um, but this idea that Reagan, through moral and force and economic force, won the Cold War is entirely wrong and, more importantly, entirely dangerous. Because Soviet officials had come to the conclusion that they were not able to keep up, not after Reagan told them, but rather years before. We now know from Soviet archives that they basically all Soviet officials of any merit understood that their system was flawed, broken, and needed repair by the late 1970s, before Reagan takes over. The problem was, it's one thing, as I said, to recognize a problem. It's another to do something about it. And the men who led the Soviet Union through the 1980s, and in the 1970s as well, were geriatric. Not only in age, but in action. The whole sclerotic system was defined by their inability to think about change, to fundamentally change, even though they all recognized it. And consequently, by the, the Soviet economy and the Soviet Union in general, essentially, marches along, twiddles along, if you will, into the 1980s. In fact, the best way to understand this dynamic is to, to think about an old Soviet joke. Um, and the good thing about Soviet jokes is you know they're good because if you're going to risk your life telling them, it might as well be a good joke. Uh, which is that Stalin and Khrushchev and Brezhnev are all riding in a train car together. And the train stops. Being good Soviet leaders, they look at each other to try to determine what are we going to do to get things moving again? That's their role in life. Stalin speaks first, as is his want, and he says, it's very simple, comrades. All we have to do is gather up all the peasants from the local village, shoot half of them, and then the other half will be really incentivized to move the train forward and get us out of here. And they debate the various pluses and minuses of this for a while, and Khrushchev says, no, 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 comrades, it's much simpler than that. All we have to do is stand up and denounce the previous engineer. That's supposed to be funny, by the way. <laughs> But then Brezhnev gets up and says, no, 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 comrades. And this is the one that really matters. No, 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 comrades. It's really much simpler than that. All we have to do is pull the curtains back, rock back and forth, and pretend that we're moving. <laughs> and this epitomizes the Soviet economy at the time that Reagan is simultaneously, importantly, simultaneously, calling it out for its inefficiencies. But the fact that he called them out for these inefficiencies did not necessarily make it that he 
show those inefficiencies. In fact, the analogy I like to use is if I command the sun to rise and it rises, do I get to take credit? So everything that Reagan was saying about the Soviets was exactly correct at the exact right time. But he was not the causal agent. That causal agent of reform, more importantly, was Mikhail Gorbachev, who arrived in 1985 willing to make those changes as a new generation leader, as a leader who was willing to upend every aspect of Soviet society. And when I say that, please take that statement to heart, every aspect of Soviet society. He wanted to infuse the Soviet society with more openness, with reform, with more democracy things that were completely antithetical to all things that good communists had learned throughout their entire lives. Which, of course, should tell you that this was not necessarily universally popular in the Soviet Union. That is to say, Gorbachev, by breaking the mold, made enemies. And consequently, he also started saying something else, this Mikhail Gorbachev, something really quite profound and important. He began to speak, by 1988-1989, of a common European home. He began to speak of the future of Russia, the future of the Soviet Union, as not necessarily being global, but rather European. In fact, he began to really invoke the century-old idea that Russians really are European. This question that has vital interest for European geopolitics, which has an obvious answer whether you're in Paris or in the Kremlin. If you're in the Kremlin, the answer to the question is, are Russians Europeans, of course. If you're somewhere to the west of that, the answer is, of course, not. And Gorbachev believed that this was finally the moment that they were going to be able to reform the Soviet Union to reach out because the other side, Western Europe that is, was also reaching out in its own new way because this is the very moment that the European Union is coming into being. This crazy idea that Europeans were going to abolish war and abolish conflict essentially by eliminating what they considered the root cause of conflict on the continent, which was nationalism in their eyes. That is to say, if we can just stop people from thinking of themselves as German and as French and as Belgian, and to get them all to think of themselves as European, well, then we'll be less likely to fight. And until that moment, by the way, we'll intertwine our economies to make it more difficult to fight as well. And this was an appeal, the idea that appealed to Gorbachev to no end, because this perfectly dovetails with the new, reformed, pacific nature of a Soviet society that would be better and yet still able to retain the important social aspects as a committed communist that he fully believed. Make no mistake about this whatsoever, Gorbachev never intended to end the Soviet Union. He wanted to save communism and save what he considered the important aspects, the social aspects, the human aspects, if you will, and therefore wanted to reach across the East-West divide to join Europe. This then brings us to the central problem that faces George Bush as he assumes office in 1989. Which is to say, he thought Reagan was wrong. He thought Reagan had been too trusting. He thought Reagan had gone too far. Because everything that Kirill Gorbachev was promising was sounding nice, but they didn't have a lot of evidence yet. More importantly, it was not clear to Bush and those around him, people with lots of national security experience who came to his administration, like Brent Scowcroft or James Baker, if a reformed and successful perestroika movement, if a reformed Soviet Union, was even, frankly, in America's best interest. And play out the logic here. Gorbachev was not trying to erode the Soviet Union. He was trying to rebuild it. So if we see him backing away from tensions and decreasing his military spending, at the same moment that he is revitalizing the economy and revitalizing Soviet industry, that means they are going to enter the 21st century on an upward swing, and geopolitics having not changed, that is a recipe for a new Cold War. Gorbachev's success, if you will, could be dangerous. Similarly, and even more dangerous, and this is part that really got under Bush's skin, Gorbachev might be so successful in convincing the Western Europeans that he was no longer a threat, that the Soviet bear had removed its claws, if you will, that they would finally ask the Americans to go home after World War II. That is to say, from their perspective, the Americans were only stationed in Europe, NATO only existed for Europe, as a defense against the Soviet bear. If it is a tame bear, you do not need a defense. And this, for George Bush, was the nightmare scenario. The nightmare scenario, by the way, that Reagan, he thought, was encouraging, by encouraging people to accept Gorbachev, by encouraging the public to appreciate Gorbachev, and frankly, to trust and like Gorbachev. It was a nightmare scenario for Bush because his history of the 20th century, as he understood it, was different from the way that others in Europe or in Russia had understood it. 
though I have to say it was complete dogma within those he brought to the White House with him. And his history of the 20th century was essentially this. That Europeans, even before the 20th century, Europeans are really good at killing each other. And they seem to like doing it. They like it so much they do it every 20 years or so. And they've gotten really quite proficient. So much so that we had to go over the first decades of the 20th century to stop the carnage. We, the United States, had to do something unusual, go over there, and because we were so successful in stopping the carnage, we did what Americans always do. We are not a colonial empire, we went home. And of course, as you all know, we had to go do it again 20 years later. And that time, as Bush understood it, American policymakers made the singular most important decision. They stayed. And you know what hasn't happened yet? Bush would argue. There hasn't been another world war yet, another European conflict. Because what Europe really needed, and by the way, I found evidence for this argument in every single American administration, from Truman on up to Obama. Every single administration has argued functionally the same thing, which is that Europeans left to their own devices are dangerous, and that we need to be there, not just as moral support, but as on-site support, essentially as the armor on the shoulder, if you will, of Europeans, to keep the peace. So consequently, if Gorbachev is really successful, and the Europeans feel safe and ask us to leave, that is literally the recipe for future conflict in Bush's opinion. But of course he faces other problems as he enters office, not least of which is those democratic movements around the world appear to be both successful and dangerous in and of themselves. In the first months in office, of course, Bush faces the first great crisis of his administration, which is Tiananmen Square. And in fact, Tiananmen Square occurs in a way that transforms it, in your minds, when I use that term, from a place into an event. That is to say, it is the crushing of the democratic movement of students in China that poses a huge problem for George Bush, who, by the way, had China experience, and thought of himself as a China expert, of what exactly the United States should do in response, and how should the United States perhaps help those students. And Bush's response was illustrative, in fact, of his entire diplomatic approach, which I like to term by the following phrase, Hippocratic diplomacy. That is to say, first do no harm. Because Bush understood two things about the Chinese uh, student marches, even though I, I argue that he actually completely misunderstood the Chinese marches. This, by the way, is the second thing that makes people quite mad. Which is to say, when we see pictures of Chinese students, and you've all seen the pictures because they've been on CNN, when you see pictures of Chinese students marching through the streets asking for freedom and democracy, first of all, the reason that most of you know that they're asking for freedom and democracy is because it was written in English for international cameras. It was not surprising that American public and the American policymakers in particular, James Baker especially, I might add, looked at those students and quite literally said, look, they want to be American. They understand the end of history argument, which, and we are the vanguard of democracy. So when they say democracy, they must want to be like us. Not true. It turns out what they want was actually quite similar to what Mikhail Gorbachev wanted, which was to reform and improve the Chinese communist system. That is to say, when people in the streets of Beijing in 1989, remember their students initially, when they asked for democracy, what they really meant was democracy as it was understood in the Chinese communist, communist constitution which is to say, a leveling, an equality, if you will. Because 10 years after Deng Xiaoping's incredible economic reforms, when Chinese citizens had been told for the first time it was okay to succeed, and okay to be profitable, and okay to better yourself above your neighbor, after 10 years, there had been not only great success, but also great frustration building. Because students, in particular, had realized that despite all the rhetoric of open opportunity, the people who got the best jobs upon graduation were the people whose fathers had the best jobs, and not the students with the best grades or exam scores or skills. Which is why the protest initially began as a protest for democracy, which is to say a leveling and equality that comes out of school into the marketplace. And of course, as you know, things spin out of control after that, after the government accuses them of being treasonous, these students who wanted to reform Chinese society and ultimately winds up on the fifth attempt having to use force, not only force, but deadly force, on the fifth attempt to take the city as that moment that we understand now is Tiananmen Square. Remember, this is a series of conflicts that plays out over the course of almost two months 
Bush's reaction is to, to recognize that he can do nothing about it. He's far away. And also, more importantly, that what he could do about it is only to make it worse. That is to say, he understands the Chinese are under great stress, just like he understands that Gorbachev is under great stress. And if he says anything wrong, that is going to perhaps give ammunition to the hardliners within each of those governments. And he has a particular historical memory in mind, which is of 1956 and in Budapest, when an American president, Dwight Eisenhower, offered rhetorical moral support, thoughts and prayers, if you will, for the democratic protesters in Hungary. And no matter what he meant to say, those protesters interpreted his, his pledge of support as the pledge of real support, that is to say, of guns, of supplies, perhaps even of troops. And Eisenhower never considered these things in the moment. And it was quite a gasp when people, when he understood that people had turned his hopes and prayers words into a reason to storm the barricades and die. And Bush, having grown up in the Eisenhower era, in fact his father was one of Dwight Eisenhower's closest golfing buddies, understood the same problem when he saw people marching at Tiananmen Square. Consequently, he tried to say as little as possible, even though he was pilloried in the press for doing so, even though he suffered in the polls, and even though he suffered politically, because he knew two things, he understood two things, that the press did not. The first was, we are already talking to the Chinese, but quietly, behind the scenes. I have sent letters. I have sent messages. I am even going to send my national security advisor as a her mission to explain to the Chinese that we are appalled by what you did, but we all have to live in the same world. And therefore, someday we're all going to have to start talking to each other. Let's at least start now. But secondly, Bush understood the Chinese democratic surge, if you will, as further validation of his own worldview, which is to say he understood that the virus of democracy had gotten into China through exposure to the West. And that virus had metastasized and had since been excised, but it was still there. And the only way to make sure the virus came back was to keep on exposing China to the West. Therefore, when others around the world and others around the country asked Bush, demanded of Bush to isolate China, to break off relations, to keep China essentially in a box, then it's his room, if you will. Bush had the exact opposite reaction, which is that we need to make sure it is as engaged and as exposed as possible, because that ultimately will lead to the democratic surge coming to fruition in the future. Now, this then is in his mind as similar protests begin to march and royal Eastern Europe in the fall of 1989. Protests in Budapest, protests in Hungary, protests ultimately even in East Germany, the most draconian, if you will, of the communist states. At each stage, there is a concern as Bush sees democratic protesters take to the streets that he must walk a fine line between, yes, of course, encouraging democracy, and President cannot encourage democracy, not not in democracy. But more importantly, he knows that if he says too much, that might provide the ammunition either for someone to protest or to pick up a rock, or for someone to order the troops to fire. And in fact, we now know the troops were actually ordered to fire, quite explicitly so. Curiously enough, the Chinese were essentially banned from any normal country in the world after Tiananmen Square, shunned as part of that word. The only three places Chinese officials really could go in the summer and fall of 1989 were North Korea, Cuba, and East Germany. It's a pretty good trifecta. And in fact, every time they arrived in East Germany, pictures of them greeting East German officials were plastered on the front page of the newspapers with the headline that essentially said, Chinese officials come to East Germany to teach us what they know about crowd control. <laughs> the threat was explicit, and the order to fire ultimately was given. It was given particularly at a place called Leipzig, where weekly protests have been building, calling for change, calling for democracy, calling for freedom to travel, calling basically for reform in general. And what was particularly important about those demonstrators, what really scared the authorities, was that initially the demonstrators had been asking to go. That is to say, people wanted out of East Germany. And then those demonstrators in early October began to chant something new, which is, we want change, and we are staying. Which is to say, it's us or you to the officials. 
in East Berlin, who ordered their troops to fire on the crown in late October of 1989. In fact, they gave the order, but as you know, because you have this maybe news to you, it was not executed. And the reason is actually really quite fascinating. As the tr crowd was moving around the ring room, quite literally getting to about 150 yards from the first lines of the police, whose guns were loaded and ready to fire, and who, by all accounts, we have some actual oral histories from this, were ready to go. They were ready to charge the crowd and to put down this insurgent movement. The East German commander did what all East German commanders do, which is to say, you do not rise in the East German military bureaucracy by showing initiative. Rather, you rise by being willing to understand that decisions must be approved multiple times. Therefore, when he has an order to fire, he does what any military commander would do. He calls for confirmation. He receives confirmation. The troops get closer. He calls for confirmation again. He receives confirmation again. The protesters is about 100 yards away. He's about to order the fire. He says, I'm going to call for confirmation one more time. And no one picked up the phone. And it was at that moment that the commander realized that if they are not answering, they are hanging me out to dry. Which is to say, they really want me to fire in the crowd, and they want to have some form of deniability. Not being willing to hang for those superiors without the guts to do it themselves, he hung up the phone and ordered his troops to retreat. But we were that close to Tiananmen happening in Europe. In fact, a similar situation arose two and a half weeks later when something entirely unexpected happened. Which is to say, in early November, the East Germans, recognizing they had a political problem on their hands, protesters in the streets, about hundreds of thousands, and decided to initiate reforms. More importantly, they wanted to initiate a new tone. Therefore, they began to do something that was completely antithetical to East German society. They began to hold press conferences, thinking that if we just explain to the people our policies, they will understand them better. The man who was tasked with being the press officer, if you will, for this, was a man named Gunter Schabowski, who claimed to have two particular attributes. First, he could read German aloud, and second, he didn't stutter. It turns out, in the pivotal moment, he had neither of those. Because Gunter Schabowski was leaving the Politburo on the, morning, in the afternoon of November 9, 1989, and was handed a series of new travel restrictions, travel reforms, really, that he was told were embargoed. They were going to go into effect sometime in the next week, but they want him to have them for his files, take it home in the briefcase, so you're ready to present it when the time is right. And these reforms were essentially going to say that people who come to the proper authorities and have the proper documentation and go through the proper channels will, in time, be properly considered for approval for travel. <laughs> That's not what he said. He went to the press conference. He gave two hours of the most boring press conference you can possibly imagine. In fact, you can actually see this on YouTube. And you can see that they're actually more open mouths than closed by the end because of all the people snoring. <laughs> and consequently, at the end, an Italian journalist said, do you have anything for us on travel? At which point, something in his brain snapped. And he recognized that, yes, I do have something in my briefcase about travel. And he pulls it out and he begins to speak. And if you ever want to see what real terror looks like in the face of a person, Take a look at that YouTube video and see the reaction on his face when he sees that the reaction of the crowd is not what he was expecting. Which is to say, he thought he was announcing something innocuous, and what he actually said was, in stuttering German, anyone who goes to the border will be allowed across. And this was televised. Which meant people began marching to the border, and marching and requesting, demanding even, to be let out because they had seen it on TV. Now this poses a problem for the security guards, because even though people told them they had orders to be let out, there were no orders. They didn't have orders. Uh, and in fact, the colonel at the Bonstrafsa station, uh, checkpoint, a uh, man named Jaeger, finds himself, like all good German officers, on the phone, calling for confirmation, calling for advice, and he can't get it because there are no orders. What am I supposed to do with these crowds that are marching the man to be let out. And at that moment, something within him snaps when the person on the other end of the phone says, well, perhaps you're too much of a coward to do what you know needs to be done. Now, the uh, uh, Jaeger, I should say, first of all, was wearing the, the medals on his sh sh 
jacket that had demonstrated that he was willing to fire upon citizens trying to cross into East West Berlin. But more importantly than that, Jaeger had an appointment the next morning with the person on the other end didn't know about. It was an appointment with his oncologist. And he was expected to get the results of the test that told him he was going to have terminal cancer. That was what the doctor had prepped him to hear. And at that moment, I like to think that Jaeger recognized that he was going to have to answer for whatever he did next. And truthfully, have to answer much sooner than he imagined. And he decides, enough already, open the gates, let them through. And of course, once people see on TV, people flowing through gates at one area, all the rest of the commanders left them open. Suddenly you have this new thing that occurred that no one expected because it wasn't planned. People dancing on the Berlin Wall, the very symbol of the Cold War, over. Uh, now, parenthetically, I have to tell you that Colonel Jaeger is still alive today. Um, it trusts you not to go to the East German oncologist to report to him. But nonetheless, his action that night really averted what could have been a catastrophe. And just play out that catastrophe for me for a moment. With me for a moment. If troops fire on demonstrators at Tiananmen Square, there's very little the United States connection to about it. Our nearest troops are several hundred, several thousand miles away. We're not going to invade Beijing. That's not the same case in Berlin. When the troops who are watching this morality play play out on the East German side, are 50 yards away, American troops with tanks and machine guns. And ask yourself this, what would you do if you're the American commander, 50 yards away from East German troops who are mowing down crowds? The orders tell you one thing, but what would you do? And if you act the wrong way, that is what we call a recipe for World War III. And this, therefore, is where I end. This is the scenario that George Bush faces when he begins to hear about the Berlin Wall falling. By the way, the book actually goes through 1990, 91, but I think this is the moment that really crystallizes Bush's thinking on this entire matter. Which is to say, as Bush received news that the Berlin Wall was falling, like everybody else by watching CNN, uh, he was dumbfounded. Sitting in a side room of the Oval Office with General Scowcroft watching, the two of them had nothing to say, nothing to say to each other except the realization that Mikhail Gorbachev must be really serious. If he allowed this, he must be serious. By the way, remember, he didn't allow it. It's an accident, but they don't know that. So Marlon Pittsburgh, the press secretary, comes into the office and says, Mr. President, you must give a statement to the press. Bush says, no, I have nothing to say. Pittsburgh comes back four more times that afternoon, asking, pleading, please give a statement to the press. Senator Mitchell has already given a statement to the press. Your opposition has already given a statement to the press. Representative Gephardt has also already given a statement to the press. We cannot not give a statement to the press. Bush finally agrees, calls the White House press corps in around the Oval Office desk, and manages to speak for the next 30 minutes without saying a word. It's really quite remarkable. Because he again knew something that the others did not, which is that he was already receiving phone calls from London, from Paris, most importantly from Moscow, Essentially saying, does anybody know what the heck is going on? And everyone was scared. And Bush therefore determines quite specifically, quite dramatically, quite literally, that he is not going to, in his words, dance on the Berlin Wall. Why? Well, back to first principles. Because the world is moving in our direction. We like these events. We may not like them if they get out of control. So why should we do anything if we're winning? Because anything we do might cause us to lose. Think about this analogy, if you will. A runner rounding third and heading home and about to score does not do two things. He does not, A, consider that the ideal moment to stop and question the rules of the game. Or B, if he's trotting in about to score, you don't slow down or speed up. You just trot in to score. Because anything else could cause you to trip. Bush's essential approach to the entire problem of the Cold War and the danger was trying to find this tightrope, walk this tightrope between saying too little and saying too much. Until ultimately, and I'll end on this, he decides to act in the aftermath, which is to say he decides to act and not be hypocritic behind the scenes for the most important decision of his entire administration, which is what to do about Germany. This thing that nobody had thought would be a real question what to do about a unified Germany 
Nobody had thought it would be a real question, so much to the point that Helmut Kohl actually was in Warsaw the night the Berlin Wall fell, and was literally in the midst of lecturing Lech Walesa, the, the Polish dissident leader, on why it was foolish to think the Berlin Wall would fall within the next 15 years, when he was handed a note saying the Berlin Wall just fell. <laughs> he then says, quite literally, I'm at the wrong party, uh, and flies to Berlin, but note he has to fly there not on a German plane, but on an American plane. Why? Because there are still regulations left over from World War II that had not been resolved. That is, the ultimate fate of Germany had not been resolved. That is to say, four powers, none of them German, had control over German sovereignty. The Soviets, the Americans, the French, and the British. And they had to agree on whatever Germany decided to do next. And here's the fun part. Nobody in Europe outside of Germany wanted the Germans to get together. And the reason is quite simple, because the last time they had been together, it hadn't been so good for the rest of Europe. And there was a large fear that a reunified Germany, once unbridled and unshackled, would be uncontrollable and aggressive once more. This idea actually permeates the public sphere in both sides of the Atlantic. In fact, I think the best embodiment of this is a statement made by that uh, famous geopolitician David Letterman, uh, who once remarked on his program that German unification will have three phases. First, economic integration. Second, political integration. Third, France surrenders. <laughs> and if you understand that joke, which you do, you understand the trepidation in European minds. But Bush thought differently. And this, I think, is his greatest diplomatic achievement. Bush understood that he could cut a deal with Cole. And the deal was as follows. I will support you in your move for unification. And I'm the President of the United States, the most powerful man in the world. I have levers of control and influence over all the other three members of the ruling powers. I can get each of them to accede to my will if you do one thing for me. And that one thing is, a unified Germany must remain in NATO. Why? In terms of first principles. NATO cannot exist without Germany. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, the biggest manpower provider, the second biggest financial provider, it's where all the bases are. It doesn't make any sense. NATO can't exist if Germany is neutral. And if NATO doesn't exist, then what are we doing in Europe? What is our invitation to be there? And if NATO dies, and with it our invitation to be in Europe, in Bush's mind, that is a recipe for war. So the singular achievement of his entire administration is making that deal come true, in essence. Making the deal come true for the Germans, the French, the British, and yes, even for the Soviets. And here's where the story gets particularly fun, and the conclusion. The Soviet understanding of how Bush managed to get German unification through is a little different from the way that the rest of the peer participants understood it. Which is to say, we now know from documents, and this is a huge issue in the historiography of this period, we now know from newly released documents, confirming something that we already suspected, which is that American policymakers, James Baker and Bob Gates in particular, gave an oral promise to Mikhail Gorbachev that NATO would not expand, one inch to the east, in February of 1990. A couple of caveats here. A couple of caveats. The first is, when they made that promise, they were talking about East Germany. And East Germany comes sort of off the table after a couple of weeks when people start to realize it really doesn't make any sense to have two different military spheres in one sovereign country. And so Soviet officials presume that the promise not moving one inch to the east that was given orally for East Germany applies to the rest of Europe. Now you know what happens next, which is in the next two administrations, of course, NATO expands dramatically right up to Russia's borders. How do you square this circle? Well, the truth is, James Baker, Michel Machal, was a lawyer. And he understood something quite important, which is that oral agreements are not worth anything. Mm -hmm. If you don't write it down, if you don't codify it in treaty, it's not going to be binding. And more importantly, it's not going to be binding on subsequent administrations. So here we have, essentially, the essential issue, the essential success of British diplomacy sowing the seed for the essential crisis, if you will, of the entire European system today. That is the entire reason why Russian antagonism is so great, because of the sense of a broken promise 
a promise that was given for a different topic through a handshake, never signed, and never binding for another party. If you will, I hate to say this, this is one of those cases where both sides are right. The Americans can rightly look in your face and say, we never gave a legitimate promise. And the Soviets can rightly look in the back of the face and say, we thought we had a promise. Sometimes wars start with less. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much.